The Gospel reading we've just heard uh, doesn't take a theological degree to uh, work out uh, what it's uh, talking about. Um, uh, essentially, uh, it's a, a picture of Jesus uh, being attractive to people from all over the area in which he lived, not just Jews, uh, but Romans and Greek speakers and others. And it's given to us in this week of Christian unity. Um, to encourage us all to see that whatever our differences, Jesus can be and should be and must be and is the focus of all our worship. But I'm going to be thinking a little more about uh, that theme on Sunday. Um, for today, I, I wanted to uh, take the opportunity to focus on uh, a, a, an English divine who is commemorated this day uh, every year, the 20th of January. His name is Richard Roll, or some people pronounce it Rolle. Uh, Roll. I'll call him Roll, and we'll just live with that. Yeah? Um, <laughs> it, he was one of the great English divines of the last millennium, but I wouldn't be at all surprised if you've never heard of him. In fact, hands up if you've heard of Richard Roll. Let's see who's... who's no, I, I thought not. Okay, so this is a deficit that needs, I think to be uh, uh, done away with. If you had lived in England in the 15th century, you would certainly have been familiar with Richard Roll. He was one of the most widely read English writers at the time. His works survive in some 400 English manuscripts and I'm told at least 70 on the continent, which is quite an achievement given that everything was written out by hand in those days. In the 15th century, he was better known, it is said, and more widely read even than Chaucer, not least by a population who were keen to understand how to live a more holy, more Christian life. In the 15th century, Roll was the kind of go-to Christian writer, uh, much like C.S. Lewis might be for us today. Roll was a hermit who had set himself apart from the world in order to draw closer to God. As time went on, he became less and less interested in earthly matters. His focus shifted towards his knowledge of God and on how that knowledge might be constantly deepened. Among his best-known works is a book called The Fire of Love, in which Roll gives an account of his more mystical experiences. He describes these in, in three kinds. He talks about first the mystical experience of a sense of physical warmth in his body. Secondly, a sense of wonderful sweetness. And thirdly, and this one really intrigues me, a kind of heavenly music that he uh, said that he could hear accompanying him when he was chanting the Psalms. I don't know about you, but when Sandra was reading the Psalm just now, um, did you hear some heavenly music? Uh, no? No. <laughs> now you see, mystical experiences like these are common amongst saints and divines throughout history. These days we might be more tempted to wonder whether they were also people with very active imaginations, perhaps even afflicted by some kind of hallucinatory psychosis. But, do you know, as with all the great mystical writers, it was true, uh, sorry, if it was true that they experienced hallucinations, it's also true that they had the wisdom and the deep grounding in their faith to interpret those dreams and visions in positive, life-giving ways. It's a challenge without years of study and a knowledge of 14th century English, uh, because Roll was writing in the 1300s in the 14th century. It's a challenge for modern readers to easily get to the heart now of what uh, Roll was teaching. But I want to just offer you some of his more famous sayings, translated into slightly more contemporary language, in the hope that you can at least glimpse some of his wisdom, some of his heart. Much of his theological wisdom was focused on the topic of love, and specifically the love between God and us, God and us human beings. 
He wanted to help his readers to grow in love and to make that love the very centre of their existence. So he said things like this. Your love is singular, that is special, unique, when all your delight is in Jesus Christ. And when you can find no joy or comfort in any other thing. It's lovely, isn't it? Rolls encouraging us to make Jesus the object and the focus of our love such that nothing else on earth can give us the same joy or comfort. I think we probably know what he means, don't we? I mean, all of us, I dare say, have focused on love for another person to then find that they're inevitably going to let us down in some way or another because they're human, just like us. Now, or we've imagined that we can find joy or comfort in acquiring some new possession or a new job or, or an honour or a gift. But over time, the joy and the comfort of such things fades. But a love, Roll says, that is exercised, focused and directed towards Jesus will never fail. It will always be singular, to use Roll's word, unique, special, delightful. Roll expands on that theme in this quote, which again I've updated into more modern language. Lord Jesus, I ask you, give me moment without measure in your love, desire without limit, longing without order, burning without discretion. Truly, the better the love of you is, the greedier it is. For it is neither by reason constrained, or by dread distressed, or by doom tempted. It's lovely, isn't it? It's a bit long. You might have to read it again when it pops up in next week's Chronicle, but Roll is speaking out of the hours that he spent as a hermit contemplating God. He, he, he recited the Psalms daily. He had this practice of always seeking and always loving God. And he found that his desire for God's love had become, in his word, greedy. I'm reminded of a saying of Martin Luther, which many of you will have heard, I'm sure, who wished that his love for God could be uh, as fixed uh, as the gaze of his family dog was fixed upon a morsel of meat on the table. Luther said, ah, if only I could pray the way that that dog looks at meat. All his thoughts are concentrated on the piece of meat. Otherwise, he has no thought, no wish and no hope. Writers like Roll can be a little disheartening to us, can't they? Or perhaps a, a little bit intimidating. We might wish that we could give up all our earthly comforts and live the life of a hermit, entirely focused on God from morning till night. But the reality is few of us are built that way, are we? I know I'm not. Life without a little home comfort. Um, would be uh, uh, really rather intolerable. We should not feel guilty, however, that God doesn't call everyone to a hermit's life of total devotion. It's an extreme way of living indeed. But hermits like Roll help us to look into new possibilities. They encourage us to take at least a step towards the kind of deep, profound union that they find with God. They advise us about where our focus and attention should be, even amid the pressures of a normal life. In Roll's case, I think his most helpful line might be this one. For love is a willful stirring of our thoughts unto God. That is the perfection of life. I'll say that again. 
Love is a willful stirring of our thoughts unto God. Can you see what Roll's suggesting? He wants us to understand that loving God is primarily an act of will. We choose to love God. Love's not an emotion or even a mystical feeling, although both may be experienced along the path of love. It is primarily a decision, a willful stirring, in Roll's words. An act of saying, this I will do. I will love God. A daily decision to put one foot in front of the other towards the final destination of being caught up in the love and the embrace of God. Well, I hope Roll has encouraged you a little today, as he has me, to direct your energies, your mind and your will towards loving God, just a little more devotedly each day. Amen.